Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, depending on where you are in the world, uh, or good evening. Um, my name is Lisa Marie Blaschka, and uh, I'm uh, Eden um, Vice President, and I would like to welcome you to this last day of the European Distance Learning Week. And uh, we've got a wonderful session here for you today uh, with a great host of speakers. Just to tell you a little bit about European Distance Learning Week, we are putting this on together with USDLA, together with their National Distance Learning Week. And um, today's session that we'll be presenting is called Digital Skills in Teaching and Learning. Are we on the right track? And the session will last for an hour and a half. Some of our speakers will not be able to stay for the entire time, so we will be having questions directly after the presentations uh, for a few minutes, and the presentation will be recorded. We have a number of wonderful speakers for you today, and I think you're really going to enjoy this session. Um, our first speaker today is Deidre Hudson, who will be talking about tackling the digital skills gap in the EU. And then Diana Andone, who will be talking about uh, how they're doing it in Romania in terms of addressing the digital skills gap and developing digital skills. Helga Dorner, who will, uh, is from Hungary, uh, will be talking about getting connected and enhancing digital competencies. And then Monse uh, Giuette, and of course I've, I'm not very good at that name, I'm terrible with Spanish names, uh, will be talking about digital skills in teaching and learning, uh, giving examples from Spain. And then Margarita Teresa Vicena is going to be talking about innovations and challenges in technology enhanced learning and some teacher perspectives. There's a lot of topics here uh, addressing digital skills and developing them and addressing the gap, uh, not just within at the EU level, uh, but uh, you know specific case studies um, uh, from individual countries. So I think you're really going to enjoy this session. Uh, just to give you some background on what we've done so far this week uh, at, in terms of uh, webinars for European Distance Learning uh, Week is we've had a session on quality, one on evolving open education. Um, we also had a panel session on Monday. Uh, and yesterday, there was a session on validation and recognition. So you, if you weren't able to attend those sessions, we encourage you to uh, go to the, um, to the Eden website and check out the recordings. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Deidre, who will be talking to us about how the EU is tackling the digital skills gap. So Deidre. It's Deirdre Hudson here in uh, Brussels. I'm afraid I had some technical problems earlier, so I wasn't able to give my presentation. So as promised, I'm back. We've sorted out the technical issues. So I'm just going to take 10 minutes, really, to run through um, my talk, which is on the digital skills gap in Europe. I'm, um, I'm from Ireland originally, and I live in Belgium. I work for the European Commission, um, DG Education, Culture, Youth and Sport. And uh, what I'm working on, really, is the transformation of education, so how education is changing with all of the digital revolution that we're seeing in our economy and in society. So there's two main kind of issues I'm working on with my colleagues, um, the skills that we need for society and the jobs market that are changing because of digital transformation, and also technology and how it's used in and for education to improve um, teaching and learning in Europe. So really those two issues. And today I'm going to talk more about the first one. So I came across this week actually a program in Ireland which is a four-part series on digital skills called Making Ireland Click. Um, and I just wanted to start with that because I think it's really nice that the whole digital skills issue has reached primetime television in a country. Um, and this is all because of David Putnam, who's a filmmaker from England living in Ireland. He's there in the bottom right picture in the middle. Um, and David is, is the digital champion in Ireland, so he's doing uh, a lot of work in Ireland to really raise uh, awareness on the need for digital skills. As you know, in Ireland we have a very strong and growing tech sector, um, so it's becoming quite an urgent thing to get people online. But, you know, this isn't just a labour market issue, this is also about participation in society more widely. So that, that's just started on Irish television. Uh, we've just had the first of, of uh, four episodes, which I think is, is a nice example. Um, so, yeah, the to the statistics, I mean, I'm sure all of you know and, and you've heard from, from the speakers earlier about the digital skills gap in Europe. It's a particularly worrying um, and pressing problem that so many people have uh, no or very few digital skills. Of course, this um, varies widely between countries. 
um, but I've just given you the statistics here. In the red, you see um, the average for the EU, so a little less than half of the European population having no or low digital skills. Um, so this is a labour market issue, but as I said, it's, it's more wider than that. This is really an issue of um, digital inclusion. So uh, we need to have these basic digital skills really to be an active um, citizen in, in everyday life, um, increasingly so, in fact. So turning to the labour market again, we know that there's um, a major problem with a skills gap in ICT professionals in the EU. I've broken it down per country here on the table, but we forecast by 2020 that we'll be uh, looking for seven, 750,000 uh, ICT professionals in Europe that we can't find. Um, so that obviously is, is a big, a big uh, policy challenge for us, really. So as I said, 45% of people in Europe having low uh, or no digital skills, 37% of the labour force having uh, very few digital skills. We also know that jobs are, are changing rapidly um, and our predictions are that 90% of jobs will actually uh, require some level of digital skills, whatever your sector, whether you're in health or agriculture or, or manufacturing. Um, and we also know that many jobs are and will change and, and, and many of the jobs we know today won't exist um, in a few years. So this is all um, very kind of pressing issues as, as policymakers that we're trying to deal with. Um, and we know the reality for business too, who are finding it increasingly difficult to recruit ICT professionals, again with variations across Europe. Um, I just wanted to say a word or two as well about the gender gap um, in uh, technology in the ICT sector. We know that women are uh, seriously underrepresented in the technology industry in Europe, making up only around 18% of the workforce, again a very uh, worrying figure. Um, we know that women are less likely than men to study in a field related to technology. If you take a, a thousand women with um, degrees in Europe, only 29 of them will hold a degree in an ICT related field. Um, and we know that there's fewer women also in management in the tech sector compared to other industries. Only around 19% of workers in the ICT industry have uh, female managers. So uh, turning to the policy responses, well, just to say that um, the digital single market is one of the main priorities for the, for the Commission. Um, what this means is basically breaking down barriers to, to maximise the potential of digitalisation. Um, and that has a strong um, skills or human capital component, as well as many other things that we're doing in the Commission concerning um, connectivity um, and broadband. Uh, it also has a strong skills component. Also in education and training, um, it is a priority for us too. In our framework, which is called Education and Training 2020, we have six priority areas. And in fact, all six relate to digital skills, but I've highlighted two in particular. The first one being about relevant and highly quality and high quality skills and competences. And the third one being about opening up education, innovating in our education systems by fully embracing the digital era. We also have, um, in terms of policy documents, some of you may know the Skills Agenda for Europe, which was adopted um, back in June uh, this year. And, and what is the Skills Agenda? It's really um, a policy statement by the Commission, plus uh, to be followed up with a series of very concrete actions to improve both the quality and relevance of skills and skills acquisition in Europe, to make skills more visible and comparable as well across borders, and to improve what we know about skills, um, so skills intelligence, and to improve the information we have to make people make better career choices. Um, so that's a policy document. I've just pulled out a quote from it this morning when I was preparing my slides. Europe faces a basic skills challenge. People need a minimum level of basic skills, including numeracy, literacy, and basic digital skills to access good jobs and participate fully in society. So I think just to draw your attention to the fact that digital skills are really seen as a basic skill that people need to take part in the labour market and in society more widely. So as I said, this is followed up by 10 actions, which we'll be rolling out um, this year and, and next year. I'm not going to, I don't have time to run through all 10. This is a sketch from a, a, a recent conference that we had. Um, but just maybe to pull out one thing there, if you look at number two um, on the graph, you'll see key competences uh, for lifelong learning. So some of you may know that we're revising the Commission's 2006 communication on key competences, which does include indeed uh, digital skills, entrepreneurial skills. So we're really having a look at that and trying to um, review it and to modernize it. And, and why is this important? Well, um, these key competences have helped uh, shape a lot of the curricula in Europe and, and have been used as inspiration for a lot of member states. As you know, we don't have any regulatory or legislative power when it comes to education. Um, the European Commission 
can really be um, a convener bringing the member states together to share best practice and, and giving policy guidance through um, communications like on uh, key competences. I'll talk in a moment about number four there, which is Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition. So just to say that the skills agenda is there as a policy statement and it's been followed up by a series of concrete actions. So I'm going to run through five things that we're doing really. Um, the first one being our cooperation with uh, EU member states and also many partner organisations, including EDEM. In that. So we have um, an expert group on digital skills and competences. Um, EDEM is a very active member of this group. Most of the group is actually um, civil servants from ministries of education working on digital skills and ICT. And we have stakeholder organisations like EDEN, like the Lifelong Learning Platform, like EUN Schoolnet, which also brings together education ministries. So uh, what does this group do? We meet uh, around every two months, um, either in Brussels or in the member states, to look at issues around digital skills. Uh, so recently we had a two-day meeting in Finland on coding and computational thinking in the agenda. So looking at what the Finns are doing, what other countries are doing to introduce computational thinking on the uh, curriculum in schools. Um, we also had a, a meeting in Hamburg on bring your own device policies and uh, what to do or not to do, um, helping schools implement a bring your own device policy. Um, and we also have plenary sessions in Brussels where we look at different topics recently. We were dealing with learning analytics. So this is a really nice uh, community, a real incubator of ideas, um, and we share and work together very closely. And that group runs, kicked off around eight months ago, and will run until 2018. We also publish key messages from the groups as well, so key policy messages part of our work. So we share experience, we work together and share different insights. Um, also in terms of working with organisations and with member states, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to mention that on the 1st of December, so just in a few weeks time, we launched the Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition. We're working with our colleagues in DG Connect on this. And this will bring together stakeholders um, from education, from industry, um, from many different organisations to work on tackling this digital skills gaps through national coalitions, so a lot of work at the member states level as well. So we'll have a launch conference on the 1st of December in Brussels. Registrations are open in case any of your organisations are interested in joining. And at this event, we'll also um, have an award ceremony for um, European Digital Skills Initiatives in the education and in other sectors as well. So that should be an interesting day. So this is a part of the Skills Agenda initiative. We had previously um, a Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, some of you may know about it, the Grand Coalition, but this is going to be a bigger um, a, a bigger kind of version of this really, um, with a lot more emphasis on the education element. So previously it was a lot of industry stakeholders, but we're really growing and expanding on what we've been doing up to now. So that might be of interest for some of you. We also have other awareness raising initiatives like EU Code Week that we ran in the middle of October, and this is to get um, bringing formal and non-formal learning really together, promoting coding, promoting co computational thinking and learning in the classroom, outside the classroom. And we had many, many thousands of events across Europe on this. It's been run since 2013. So that's in terms of cooperation with different organizations. Um, in terms of platforms and training, um, I'm happy to say that actually just last week we relaunched Open Education Europa. That's a website that myself and my colleagues uh, run here on innovating education in Europe, and it's a hub for sharing best practice. Um, we have uh, basically restructured the site. We hope we've made it simpler, easy to use. Um, it's still in a beta version. Not everything is working on the site uh, quite yet, but I'd really like your input and your feedback on that and how we can improve it. So it's really a, a space, a community where people can come together and share what they're doing to make education more open, more innovative, how they're using digital technologies, how they're tackling this digital skills gaps. So I think uh, the Eden community might be interested in getting involved on this website, and I'd really welcome that. Uh, we have many other platforms. We have ePale for adult learning. We also have the eTwinning network, which is a very, very large network of, of teachers in Europe who come together for training, for classroom to classroom cooperation and projects. Um, and they just had their annual conference recently looking at the whole area of digital literacy. I thought I'd mention too, um, European Schoolnet Academy, we work in close partnership with European Schoolnet, also based here in Brussels, and they run many fantastic courses for teachers on their Schoolnet Academy, and that could be something um, worth checking out as well if you're not aware of that already. So that's platforms and training. Of course, we have our funding programs. Many of you will know about this already. So many funding programs which are supporting digital skills, digital skills training, um, closing the digital skills gap. 
we have our Erasmus Plus project, which would be the big project for my department, Education and Culture. We also have the European Social Fund, which does many, many projects on digital skills training. And we have Horizon 2020, which is the big research framework uh, funding program as well at EU level. So just to say these funding programs are also helping for many, many projects on the digital skills area. Um, in Erasmus Plus, we have a thousand plus projects on, on digital skills and ICT in education. So um, happy to answer any questions. People can contact me afterwards. My email address is at the end if you have any questions on the funding. Just to say we also fund uh, ministries of education working together on innovative projects and policy experimentations, we call them. And there's a number running um, at the moment in the ICT field. So just to mention as well, um, we also uh, commission research and we work very closely with the Joint Research Centre in Seville, which is a European Commission body. And there's a team of researchers there working on ICT, on open education, on digital learning. Um, and those reports are available online for everybody. So just to say that we're also trying to keep on top of the whole research field to look at emerging areas in digital skills and, and digital learning. So that could be something of interest to you as well. And finally, I thought I'd mention too some of the competence frameworks um, that we've developed also with the JRC in Seville and, and with the support of our working group on digital skills and competences. Um, probably the one that's best known is the digital competence framework for citizens. So, of course, there's a lot of talk about what competence means. Um, is it about coding? No, it's not just coding. It's also about literacy. It's about safety. It's about communication. So the creative use of, of technology. So we've um, developed with the, with the JRC a competence framework for citizens, which has been taken up in many, many countries and has helped shape curriculum there, has shaped also initiatives in uh, outside formal learning. Um, and that's been revised this year uh, to Digicom 2.0. Um, and it's organic, it's been, it's been changed all the time. So that's something I thought I'd draw your attention to. I think other speakers referred to it earlier in the panel. And we also have um, the competence assessment framework for organizations that we've developed and we're working on a competence framework for teachers as well for educators so that's work that's ongoing that helps uh, shape and, and influence curricula and the member states can take it up um, they can modify it they can change it it's out there for them to use so in my short presentation i've tried to run through the policy challenges that we face in digital skills and um, there is a very urgent need to tackle this digital skills gap it's an opportunity for us as well to create more growth and employment um, this is a labour market issue, but it's a lot more. It's about digital inclusion. It's about allowing people to participate fully in society. Um, and I've run you through some of the initiatives. Obviously, in the short time, I haven't been able to talk about everything. But I've run you through some of the initiatives that we're doing with different partners, because I think that really is the solution to work with government, with education, with education systems, with industry. Um, and I think only together that we'll actually make a difference in, in tackling this gap. So I've tried to run you through some of the awareness raising activities, some of the new things in the pipeline, like the Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, the launch conference on the 1st of December, and also our new website, Open Education Europa. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer any questions by email. Sorry again about the technical problems earlier, um, and I look forward to, to being in touch with many of you. Thank you. Diana, if you would like to take the floor, Diana is Director of the eLearning Center at the Polytechnica University of Timisoara. Timisoara, Romania, and she will be talking to us today about developing digital skills, um, a bottom-up strategy in Romania. So, okay, good. Perfect. The floor is yours, so, yes, Diana. I'm here in the Polytechnica University of Timisoara, Romania. Today is a very special day in a way for us because it's our university day. Uh, back uh, 96 years ago, in 1920, we were established as a Romanian Technical University here in the very west corner of Romania. So I'm presenting in a special day of my university. I'm not very proud of that. But I'm going to speak more about the digital skills, what we are doing here in Romania. And because we just lost Didri, I'll go quickly over the things which I suppose she would have said is about the digital competence frameworks for citizens, which the European Union just recently has re-released, the 2016-2015 version, which includes also is part of the Europass nowadays. And as you see, there is a huge gap 
between certain countries, as you already seen in the last slide, which Didri had, about um, what's happening in Europe in different countries in terms of digital competences and digital skills. I quite like this idea which uh, the British uh, GISC Asso Association has uh, included about the developing of the student digital literacy because it speaks more about what we need to focus on as we need to focus on the digital creation, on the communication, digital learning, not just on how we use this information, data and media literacy, which is mainly the things which we are looking for. But uh, they complete with the digital literacy the seven elements where they look much more, as you can see, at the career and identity management and of the learning skills which you need to develop. Because here we strongly believe that the 21st century worker will need to learn digitally for his entire life. And it's our job to prepare them for that. So what is really happening is that these are the skills, as Steve Wheeler, which is also a member of Eden, a quite prominent member of Eden, has showed to us that they are the digital literacy skills which we need for our students, which is social networking, trust literacy, maintaining privacy, but also creating the content, organizing it and sharing, through all the reusing and repurposing, everything which is including in the managing of the digital identity of everybody. And these are part also of the digital competencies and skills which are included in the Europass nowadays. The DESI, which you're probably aware of, is the Digital Economy and Society Index, where you can see, for example, Romania is on the last place. On the last slide, again, I'm referring to Didri's last slide, you've seen Romania the third on the ICT professionals and so on, which is true. But DESI looks much more than the connectivity and the human capital. is used also at the digital public services and the integration of the digital technology, where is a huge gap in Romania, as just 52% of the entire population of Romania have access daily to the internet. But this is coming quite strangely, as, as I said, and you already mentioned, Romania and the ICT is, is huge. So part of the ICT and the ICT professionals, which are working in either information and communication technologies or in the automotive field is quite big. And I'm coming from a region which is, has a very high number of digital companies, as we call them, the companies where people work with a lot of digital tools and where is a lot of intellectual output as part of the product to, to deliver the final product. So these are the biggest challenges which we are facing. In terms of education, we have a lot of technical education. As you see in this last statistic, which we had from 2014, from the graduates from the universities in Romania. So it should look that we are doing well. But we are still the last place in the European Union in terms of the numbers of higher educated people, according uh, to the last Eurostat from 2014. So we organized a needs analyze for digital competencies in the last maybe five years in Romania. And the biggest challenge for us is that there is not a clear national strategy and approach. Just recently, last week, one was discussed and is going to be approved. Exists a very large digital divide between the regions in the west and in, around the capital in the south. There are much more developed regions. In the east, it's not the same. Also, it's sometimes in the middle of the country, it's not the same. There are some big rural areas in Timisara, which are mainly agricultural and doing uh, the 20th century industry, more or less. There is a need for structural training and for the encouragement of the entrepreneurship in this area. It's a high need of high ICT skills. We have a huge shortage still of the ICT higher educated persons, even that we produce quite a lot, as we say, because the companies, in the, especially in the Western Romanian uh, region, are asking for even more than this. There is also a big need of communication and multicultural skills. So in terms of this, we were thinking for the last 10 years here in the university to change completely the engineering education based much more on the computational thinking. Computational thinking doesn't require that you need to know programming. It's much more requiring on the way how you deal with uh, solving problems, that you learn from abstract to practice by solving some problems. And for this, you follow a very logical 
pattern and a very logical path. So that's the main idea. And this is because we really want to prepare for the 21st century creative creators, which can go the extra mile to innovate and create things using digital technologies or digital uh, skills. We have a lot of masters and post-university degrees. We also encourage a lot of Erasmus exchanges and uh, part of the Erasmus project, we also have some digital competencies project. So this is part of the everyday work. But I'll try to show you something which we are doing a bit extra. First is uh, the Romanian MOOC, the Romanian Massive and Open Online Learning uh, Courses, which was launched last year and which is dealing mainly for courses with basic levels skills and so on in different subject area from ICT to, as you see, open education in this uh, field, also from mechanical engineering and a bit of economics and also about terms of uh, how you uh, cite correctly, how you deal with plagiarism and so on. So there are very different kinds of skills which we are presenting and we are developing courses with together with our Romanian partners in this Unicampus uh, platform. For example, this is how it looks, but this is the most important, some, at least at this moment, course, is an M Commons course, which was delivered um, to a lot of people, which are coming from companies, small and medium companies, enterprises and companies, which have almost no knowledge of ICT. They have very, very little knowledge of ICT, and we wanted to prepare them to get ready to be included in the, how to say, in the M Commerce world. So we have from hairdressers to uh, garage to auto, to automotive um, a lot of other parts. We had some small shops which wanted to be involved in e-commerce. We had the company which was producing some uh, bio cosmetics and so on, which wanted to move to the e-commerce world and which came through this. So this is clearly a good idea to establish some small courses with basic skills for those which are non in the ICT area. Another project which we are doing for the last years is virtual mobility, which is usually done with the university students, and we've done it in the last seven years, and involves some students from Romania working with students from the United States, commonly and jointly for eight weeks to deliver a multimedia product. And uh, there are 707 students until now involved, and there was a no dropout until now. So they need to work completely collaboratively using synchronous and asynchronous tools to communicate and to be able to go further to all of that. Sorry. So all of this, it's a it's a bit a bit of delay, and I'm worrying about that. So the, the idea of the Talk Tech project was mainly to be able to create a multicultural environment where they will need to learn online on how to do things. So this is, for example, a project which was done in 2015, and there is uh, done in a lot of, uh, using a lot of tools. It's about how to uh, design things for staying healthy. These are the tools which, for example, they are using, quite a lot of them. In total, in this project, the students use about 18 different tools to be able to finish their product. So they develop a lot of other skills, digital skills, communication skills, multicultural skills to be able to finalize this project. That's a good example of uh, here, if it's playing, uh, which shows, for example, what our students have been able, it's not playing, uh, it's an interesting example on how in six seconds our students were able to show which is the best messaging app by using two seconds uh, for three different um, applications which are using used for messaging in, on mobile phones, and it's a very interesting one. Also recently, my city has won uh, the European Capital of Culture for 2021, and my university was uh, strongly involved in this bid. And we have uh, three projects, which are digital projects. There is a strong, uh, how to say, input in this uh, project, in this entire program for the 2021 to become a digital city and to become the first digital and virtual European Capital of Culture 
So there is going to be a even stronger need of developing the digital competencies for those which are not at this moment in, uh, in the ICT field. And this is the reason, for example, just uh, two days ago, we had a workshop for digital skills and competencies in culture, where we had almost 100 participants in the room. And also, as it was live stream, another uh, 50 which were following us live streaming. And it lasted for almost a whole day on training a lot of uh, the cultural actors on how to use digital skills, how to use augmented and virtual reality, how to use Web 2.0 technologies from the basic to a bit more advanced skills. And that's just the beginning. And this is part of our involvement in the ICT community from this region in Timisoara, but also in Romania. Another example is how we start training uh, in small programming skills. The student, the young students, as we call them, from age 18 to age 18 in Coder Dojo. Coder Dojo is a large movement which started in Ireland. I'm pretty sure that Didri, for example, would have known about it. And in Timisoara, we have one of the strongest metropolitan area in Coder Dojo, as there are 14 dojos and almost 1,000 children nowadays involved. And everything is done through volunteer work. And they are learning very basic programming skills. And it's encouraging them to start being more confident in the digital world and know what to do. Then we also refer to the entrepreneurship uh, part of the digital skills and competencies uh, by having since 2014 in every six months a Dimishara Startup Weekend where we encourage small companies or small or even private person to come with their ideas, they are judged and then they get finances to get into an accelerator and to become uh, some viable products which then can be included in the, in the market. We look also at the higher education and we promote strongly the students which are, have very good projects through the interactive digital media student contest which is held every year in the last three years and where we had some really amazing products uh, uh, which we were, were awarded. But one of the major things which we do also together with our partners which you see there in the right, the main partner is Startup Hub and Banat IT which is a big association which deals with ICT in this west region of Romania, is the hackathon, where in the last years, in every hackathon, we had almost five to 600 persons which were actively involved during the weekend on producing something uh, related with ICT as a product which is needed in the community. The beauty of the hackathon is that it's not just uh, programmers which are coming there, software developers, but they are communications. There are business uh, people. There is a lot of, um, how to say, media which is going around. So it's really increasing the abilities of everybody of um, being aware of what digital skills and competencies they will need for the future and what can be done just from a very small and tiny idea with a bit of support from software developers, how a beautiful product can be developed. We have done one in open culture. So, which was in 2015, and we are repeating it in this year, about uh, doing ICT projects in culture, so which will be involved in that. One of the best projects which uh, was resulted of the hackathon is continuously developed through the team from the Polytechnica University, is an art theme, which shows with augmented reality all the public art, uh, which is in the Timisoara region. There are almost 200 public arts pieces in, on the street, and uh, when you go nearby, you will have some explanation about them and what's happening there. So these are our responses to our Romanian needs analysis. We started with a bottom-up approach with some institutional strategy, but mainly working in the community nearby, doing some online training, as we already showed through the Unicampus, a lot of entrepreneurship uh, activities which are encouraging the ICT development and the encouragement of everybody to move somehow towards the digital part of their life, uh, developing on the high ICT skills, again, communication and multicultural skills, which are very important in the digital world. Also, qualification of the teachers and the trainers. We have some post-university degrees for teachers and training on how to use digital uh, tools and uh, digital uh, concepts even in education. 
and also obviously some validation and accreditation locally. So if you need anything else, just please contact me and I'm ready for questions and the slides will be also on SlideShare but you will also have them through the Edo network. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Are there any questions for Diana about uh, her Romania case study on digital skills? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Okay, Johanny has a question. Uh, what do you see as the main disadvantage with low digital literacy in the population, Diana? As based on our research is uh, mainly access to information. So I will give you just one single example. Access to the digital uh, skills and to digital literacy and the uh, skills in the digital literacy allows a lot of people to access uh, the website, for example, where there are a lot of calls for different projects and different funding. If there are a lot of projects, for example, through the European Social Fund for Romania, which are in the agricultural sector, and the ICT skills of those which are working in the agricultural sector, even if there are larger farms, not just small familial, I mean, based on a family farm, mm -hmm. Um, which don't have those skills and that's one of the biggest challenges for them to access the fund because everything from the information to the submission is done online and it's, it's a basic thing which they will need to do. So that's one of the things which you have, access to information. Then obviously is access to anything if you want to even renew your ID, if you want to find out anything about property development in the city or in anywhere in Romania, all that information is nowadays online. And you have the need to have basic digital skills to be able to access them. So that basically I see that the main gap is here, the main gap between the very high educated people, the ICT professional and those which are working in non in the ICT professions, which are very eager to access this world and very eager to know about more more about information. But sometimes even more than accessing a social media network or accessing a very simple website, they have no idea how to do it. They will don't know how to fill even a form online. So that really, it's a huge gap between them. Mm -hmm. And that's the basic thing which I see is the biggest problem is access, proper access to information, in some cases to funding, in some cases for further development, mm -hmm. or in some cases even for a small company as we had this uh, bio, eco biological uh, cosmetics company mm. which wanted to sell her product online and she couldn't uh, because she had no idea how to establish a shop where to look how to look she realized that her products are cheaper much more cheaper than a lot of others with the same characteristics so mm. it's just changing some people's world if you introduce them to proper use of technology have you encountered any difficulties with the, your instructors in terms of getting them um, up to speed or on board? Um, yes, sometimes. Um, they are, for example, as we do a lot of our training also online, they can't access it. So this is why we split. We do workshops which are face-to-face, -face, even for a day, because it's quite difficult for a lot of them to be away for a longer period mm -hmm. where we introduce them to the basic concept and then the rest we follow online. And that's the thing which uh, we are really trying to, to do nowadays. Mm -hmm. Plus we do all of these big, big events which are for everybody, which are very highly uh, publicized. Um, there's a lot of media attention to them, which is also encouraging them to come to, not necessarily just to the university, but to the entire community in this part which is delivering mm. a sort of training or encouraging them to, to look at the digital world. Okay. I see, uh, Johanny also, will the gap become smaller in the future? If yes, how? <laughs> yes, I think it will come smaller in the future, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> how? Um, I think basically a lot of training and proper exposure. Even if through media, there is, there is uh, for example, there are some small media news in a lot of very large television outlets which will show you different tools and how to do things and so on, which are very short and very dedicated to a specific skill and so on. Even that will encourage them to do it. Mm -hmm. Last is uh, the, it's becoming compulsory. So for example, nowadays when you are in the fifth, sixth grade, so you are age 11, 12, 
you already start doing a bit of programming and you have uh, from, in fact, from the age of seven, you have some computing skills, uh, um, how to say, courses integrated in the curricula, in the compulsory curricula. So as we go further in times of those which already are probably going to graduate quite soon, we have even more prepared workforce to have uh, proper digital skills, even for those which are non-ICT. As I said, Timshara is huge and Western Romania is huge in the ICT professionals. We have mm. a lot of them, even a, sh a shortage, but uh, it's a big gap mm. between even the country and even in between the profession. Okay. I think we could probably have a whole session just on discussing the digital digital divide and, and how to reduce the gap. Um, Deidre is back online uh, and uh, her audio is working again, so what I'd like to do is hand it over uh, to her so that she can uh, uh, continue on with her presentation. Deidre? Thank you so much. Okay, there still seems to be some problems with Deidre's uh, microphone. Um, yeah, Deidre, I think that would be a great idea if you would record the session later, um, and then we will try to include it. So, um, Christina, let's let's try to uh, check in with Deidre later and and ask her to um, to put together a recording of a presentation so that we can include it as part of this week. And I'm, I apologize uh, to those who have come to hear Deidre speak today. Um, so we'll. You know, but we will put together a recording of her presentation. All right. With that, I'd like to move on to the next presentation, which is from Helga Dorna, who works at the Center for Teaching and Learning at the Central European University in Hungary. And she's going to be talking to us today about uh, getting connected and enhancing digital competencies through curriculum internationalization uh, in higher education. So Helga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa, and um, thank you for inviting me uh, to join this uh, panel today. And um, I am not going to give you, let me start with, you know, by saying that what I'm not going to talk about. So I'm not going to uh, give you a national perspective, but more like um, a case study, which is embedded in educational research, basically. So my contribution to the reflections on the new digital skills agenda will focus on exploring the question of how to um, enhance digital competencies through curriculum internationalization in higher education. And I would like to propose um, a model and, and how that model could eventually be um, put into practice in the higher education classroom. So I will talk about some pedagogy as well. And I hope that uh, you don't mind, since this is not really uh, directly linked to policy analysis. Um, but in any case, just to locate um, and just to highlight the, um, the relation between this topic and, of course, the new digital skills agenda for Europe, um, I would like to start with uh, the three priorities for action. And I underlined priority number one, which is improving the quality and relevance of skills formation. So basically the project, the model and the actual application, uh, classroom application is linked to this sort of priority, which is the number one priority within the document of the European Commission. The document also talks about uh, various skills um, that should be uh, enhanced uh, within the framework, of course, of higher education. Um, skills such as transferable skills to work in a team, um, creative thinking, problem solving, um, competences such as digital competences, entrepreneurship, 
critical thinking, problem solving, learning to learn, and so on. And the document uh, also problematizes the fact that maybe uh, these, uh, the development of these skills is not so much integrated in university curricula. And, um, and out of these uh, competencies, digital competencies is, of course, uh, the primary topic of today's uh, session. So let us briefly look at how the European Digital Competence Framework handles basically uh, digital competencies. So it highlights five key areas, information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, uh, digital content creation, safety, and problem solving. And of course, these five uh, key areas are further broken down into 21 uh, competencies. And uh, these, uh, the, this clear distinction of competencies helps, of course, university teachers and students in higher education to orient themselves when it comes to skills development in these areas. Now, the big question um, for us uh, I guess, in higher education, and if I talk about my own case as a teacher and lecturer um, in higher education, like how to integrate these competencies in teaching and learning in higher education. And I argue that one possible solution is, of course, through curriculum internationalization. But what do I mean by curriculum internationalization? At least defines it, the incorporation of an international and intercultural dimension into the content of the curriculum, as well as the teaching and learning processes and support services of a program of study. So it's not necessarily about inviting a couple of guest lecturers or um, having some uh, uh, international readings, but it's a much more complex issue. And it, it, uh, it also focuses on how to transform teaching and learning processes and how to come up with a meaningful design to do that. And of course, uh, if we want to do course redesign or curriculum redesign with an eye on the internationalized curriculum, then of course we have to know the characteristics of the internationalized curriculum, which reflects the plurality of knowledge, engages students in critical inquiry, uh, of diverse sources and contexts of knowledge, and of course requires a broader perspective to course contents, which is of course supposed to prepare our students to become um, successful in a complex and globalized world, and of course reflects commitments to developing and supporting critical thinking and active student learning. And if we go back to the European Digital Competence Framework, we can see some overlapping notions uh, so basically, what we can um, draw, as, you know, at this point in time, as some sort of a conclusion, is that if we try to integrate internationalization and internationalize our curriculum, then eventually we could come up with an idea of how to also um, integrate digital competencies. So how to how to get digital? How to um, uh, enhance digital competencies through internationalizing the university curricula. And of course, um, Diane also touched upon this question of virtual, their students' virtual mobility. And basically, this is directly linked to that, to those projects. Since the concept of curriculum internationalization has uh, already included new perspectives on technological advances, because students with virtual mobility, such as um, internet access and, of course, ICT, can now be considered as international students, and they can potentially have international learning experience if digital technologies are used to internationalize content and approaches to teaching and learning in the curriculum. So eventually, we could easily involve uh, groups of international students and expand our own classrooms. So basically the model that I'm, uh, ha we have been working with and I'm proposing here is of course, uh, encompasses uh, ICT, information and communication technologies through which online collaborations can be established and through that digital competencies can be enhanced. The other big element within the model is of course the internationalization outcomes 
which are, for example, cultural awareness, critical thinking, interdisciplinary thinking, reflective thinking, and so on. And of course, we do have the strictly speaking curriculum framework, which of course focuses on discipline specific competencies. And enhancement of the digital skills through internationalization happens at the intersection of these three areas. And you can see the arrow pointing to that area. And the next question, which I usually get from my colleagues and fellow researchers, is of course, okay, this model is you know, really nice, looks nice, fancy. But how do you apply the model in actual teaching in higher education? So how would you redesign your curriculum? How would you redesign your course uh, if you were to follow this model? Well, there have been some uh, uh, models in, in practice, in, in uh, classroom practice at different higher education institutions. And of course, the methodological precedent is the telecollaboration, where online activities and interaction with foreign partners are integrated into the in-class face-to-face activity. And we at our institution, uh, we have developed the so-called International Collaborative Seminar, uh, which is a regular university course uh, that involves two in-person learning communities located at two simultaneous teaching sites that collaborate through video conferencing and asynchronous online work. In practice, it means that we have a group here in Hungary and Budapest, and we have another group in Estonia, and we work throughout the semester uh, together with these two groups and with two teachers, basically. And of course, uh, uh, our fellow colleagues uh, in Australia, Barney Dardano, who also have been playing around with this model, developed the polysynchronous learning um, um, classroom environment, and uh, colleagues in Hong Kong uh, used the term blended synchronous learning for, to describe this sort of setup. But the point is that, um, that basically, um, Telecollaborations or international collaborative seminars or these uh, blended synchronous learning environments give us an opportunity to integrate enhancement of digital skills through internationalizing our curricula. But what are concrete, actual, practical, pedagogical uh, uh, solutions, if you will? For example, a structured online discussions to reflect on cultural and regional differences and values and assumptions affecting the discipline and how these might affect the actions of individuals. Or group projects that require working online with peers from another cultural group to compare and contrast perspectives on similar professional issues or uh, synchronous and asynchronous online discussion groups that link students from different cultures to enable them to complete tasks, solve problems, gain international perspectives on issues, or establish international networks. So basically, it's not, about, it's not only about inviting guest lecturers, it's not about adding extra readings to include international perspectives, but basically redesigning courses to um, to allow students, to allow our students to collaborate uh, online, through online tools, and eventually to solve problems, to think creatively, to reflect on their learning through digital competencies. And through this uh, methodology, uh, digital competencies and the enhancement of these competencies is integrated in the curriculum, which after all is so much needed, as stated by the European Commission document. But of course, I mean, this is just too ideal. I mean, we, as, as it is with all, uh, with all innovations, if you will, there are some challenges and, of course, some benefits. Just to give you a couple of uh, ideas about challenges, of course, it demands, uh, demands are placed on teachers and students as well in such a setup. The teachers, the university teachers, have to split their attention between uh, the two student groups, face-to-face -face students, remote students, uh, trying to promote seamless interaction among the groups and members between the groups. And of course, that has eventually the implication that they have to compromise on their pedagogical approaches. And of course, talking about our students, this, this can be also an imposition since face-to-face uh, -face students, uh, for example, are in a way intimidated by the uh, camera, the video conferencing uh, setup, eventually the transactional distance. But nevertheless, just to you know, close my, my quick presentation and reflection uh, by, uh, with some 
positive uh, ideas. If we revisit the digital competency key areas, then we can see that indeed there are some overlaps and there, this, these overlaps basically show us that there is indeed hope for a meaningful integration. And uh, I'll just uh, focus on a couple of points such as through this model and through this integration, our own face-to-face -face classrooms are opened up and uh, make the academic engagement for our students relevant to life in a broader sense. And of course, there is this ongoing and sustained sense of shared responsibility for learning together as a community to develop a trusting environment and to develop interpersonal relationships. And of course, uh, the, uh, the, the whole setup supported by digital technology uh, provides students with hands-on experience with telecollaborative practices and digital skills development. So just to round off uh, my quick um, presentation, yes, the, the subtitle of this panel is, of course, whether the question whether we are on the right path. Uh, I think uh, the research which has gone into this uh, blended synchronous learning on telecollaborations or virtual mobility of our students has proved that we have uh, moved into the direction of meaningful integration of the skills enhancement in higher education curricula. And we hope to continue this work. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions about the research behind it, about the model, please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Helga. That was a, a very interesting um, discussion, a very interesting presentation. Um, we, we do this uh, within my program. Uh, we have quite a few stu students from UNISA um, who uh, are part of our program and uh, many students in the U.S. So there's a real, um, there's a real sensitivity or realization of, of the differences that, that, are, that, are, that occur with, you know, in terms of digital skills gap uh, between the two different countries. And so I think a, a real sensitivity um, about those gaps uh, um, is, uh, comes through that kind of curriculum where there's intercultural involvement. Um, checking here to see if we have any questions in the chat. Most of the, quest, uh, the comments right now in the chat are about uh, digital skill gaps, uh, generation gaps that also occur. Uh, are there any questions um, for Helga? Okay. Um, I just have a short question, Helga, and that is, um, how do we, in, in, this, in this current political environment um, of, of uh, a move toward more nationalization, how do we realize these kinds of collaborations with other institutions? Do we need to get um, our leadership involved in realizing this? Maybe one of the, uh, uh, the research studies has uh, shown that uh, one of the big obstacles of not having too many of these uh, initiatives at the, at the institutional level or at the national level is, of course, the lack of support from management. And uh, because it's a, it's a huge mm. commitment, um, resource-wise, resource is not so much uh, a commitment, but definitely um, a commitment to opening up classrooms, which is, of course, part of the Open um, uh, Learning Initiative, is, uh, is a mm. very sensitive issue. Yeah. So uh, yes, indeed, we would need support from university management. That's like a very yeah, I could imagine if there was a win-win win yeah. situation. <laughs> okay, Diana has a question. Uh, she's asked, uh, can you describe a specific experience of a student or group of students who have uh, used this yes. approach? Uh, so we have uh, had so far four of these um, seminars. And, um, and for example, uh, when we had our students here in Budapest and our students in the United States uh, from different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, I think the most beneficial uh, about the situation was, of course, the intercultural engagement, eventually multicultural, because in our classroom as well, we had mm -hmm. uh, uh, different uh, nationalities represented as well as in the US classroom. But going beyond that, so the, the physicality that we are here, you are there, I think much more intriguing was for our students to explore uh, how uh, certain 
how certain ways of thinking can be transformed in a community and how we can take responsibility for each other's learning through a very close collaboration. Mm. And the second thing, which was uh, great to experience for someone, you know, teaching uh, master students and doctoral students in particular, that uh, we are closed up in our disciplinary silos. So we focus on our own research. We focus on our mm. own teaching. But opening up our classrooms this way and become interdisciplinary, which is actually also suggested by the European Commission document, that inter interdisciplinarity should be, you know, supported uh, and, and eventually integrated uh, in the higher education uh, classroom. So I guess interdisciplinarity and, and breaking down these, these barriers, uh, I think that's a very useful experience for our students. At least this is what uh, they reported on when they were interviewed and surveyed and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, we also have some feedback from Liz who says that she appreciates that you show us uh, clearly what you do in practice. I, I think that's also very important that we see how it is that we can realize the things that we want, that we want, to, want our instructors and our students to uh, adopt. So I think a uh, very good point. Okay, moving on to the next presentation. Uh, we have Mante Jutua. Um, uh, who is the Director of Digital Competencies Program of Studies, Psychology and Science Education at the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya um, and in Spain. And she will be talking about digital skills and teaching and learning, the case of Spain. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. Please take the floor. Looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you also to Eden to invite me to this presentation. I am a researcher at the WOC University, it's an online full university created in 1995. And I work there, I have been working there until more than 30 years. My objective today is to talk about the digital skills teaching and learning in Spain. Let's go to start. Okay. I talk about two things, the digitalization in Spain in general, and also the digitalization in skills and teaching in, and learning in Spain. The first one, I'm going to talk about digitalization in Spain, but in relation to Europe, and I introduce the framework of digital skill in Europe. Here, you can see in the slide, I'm talking about the digitalization in Spain according to Eurostat. You can see Spain have a 55% basic skills and 74% percent basic skills in communication. You can see in this slide, according to European Commission, Spain is the 15 to 28 countries in digital skills in Europe. If you can see, Spain is improving in terms of connection and internet use, but it remains weak in relation to digital competence. Only 45%, as the Z report says. In this scenario, I want to talk also about the digital agenda from Spain. It's presented in February. 2015 and have some important goals in education. The goals are in education and ICT, the teacher training and lifelong learning, the virtual environment, and also the common framework and reference, 
and finally in the education community. Now I will talk about the framework of Digicom. Mm, it's a framework is based on use as a support policy through our building, provide common language in how to identify and evaluate the key areas, as also a tool to improve citizen and plan education and training initiatives. In this framework that some about before, we, there are they have five areas and also 21 competencies. Here we have the implementation of Digicon in Europe, but I want only to talk about the implementation in Spain concretely. You can see we have implementation in policy support, also in assessment and employability, and finally in specialties in teaching and learning. Now I want to talk about digital skills and teaching and learning in Spain concretely. And as you see before, we have we want to talk about the policy support in Navarra, who the Department of Education use Digicom as a key reference for strategy and planning. And also the base about the assessment and employability, the best um, country have a specific project called ICANOX, um, and it is designed by the best government using Digicom framework, and this includes an online testing tool that based in Digicom areas. Also, Andalusia have a portal, Andalusia Digital, by the regional government of Andalusia, and it offers a free of change online self-assessment about the five areas of Digicom. And after the self-assessment, um, can access to uh, training materials in the different five areas. Also, in, here in Catalonia, we have an ACTIC, it's an accreditation system for ICT competence in Catalonia. That is active since um, 2005, um, and this model is previous to Digicom. I talk a little more about this accreditation. This accreditation um, is a start in 2005 and work participating in the definition of the, this competence, culture and participation in digital series, digital technology, computer and operating systems, browsing and communication in digital work, writing information and management, management, graphics, audio and video management, digital information management, data management, and content presentation. These three, this accreditation are three levels, initial level, intermediate level, and advanced level. At this moment, this accreditation are working to improve in relation to Digicom. Now, I want to talk about teacher professional development. As you can see previously in the map, we have in Spain the Ministry of Education in TEF create a common framework for teaching digital competence based on Digicom. And it uses the planning teacher professional development. And we have some specific MOOCs, some MOOCs, and some digital resources to improve the digital competence from the teacher. Also, in Spain, in Extremadura, there are a teacher digital competence portfolio. And in Catalonia, in 2014, we had an interdependent project 
on teachers digital competence and I participate in this interdepartment projects and this proposal is according to the framework of digital training competence and con consists in two kinds of knowledge. The first one is ICT competence, refers to instrumental use and technology who are framed in the ACTIC, the accreditation in Catalonia. And also the teaching skill and methodology organized in five dimensions, design, planning and implementation of education, organization and management of space and educational resource, communication and collaboration, ethics and digital citizens, and professional development. Those are the teacher professional development. And now I want to talk about the student's digital competence in Spain. We have a definition of digital competence for primary and secondary school. INTEF made the, defini the definition and is about the five dimensions about Digicom, information, communication, content creation, safety and solving problems. One second, I can see now, sorry. In Catalonia, we have also a specific definition of a student's competencies according to teacher competencies and to active dimension accreditation and the dimension are instrumental and application, information process and organization of work and learning environments, interpersonal communication and collaboration, and citizens' habits, civility and digital identity. Now I want to finish this part about the, in Spain, we work since 1994 in different programs to introduce the ICT in schools. And one important program is Programa Escuela 2.0. And it provides one top per lab in Chile, in the classroom, and make teacher change the teacher methods. Currently, we have some different programs. One is about European School Net, Digicom. The other one is M schools. Mm, M school is it's working is about mobiles and it's in coordination about mobile work capital in Barcelona. And we have a lot of projects also about mm, computers and and so on. But mm, also they are specific projects. We cannot speak or or whether digitalization in the school. Now I will finish this presentation and to talking about the, the program of the work in high education area. You know work is a is an online fully university and we have in this online fully university a specific com competence called use and application of digital technology in academic and professional context. And here I show you the, the program about the different level at the, at the digital competence. In the first level, digital divide, we call the third dimension at the university, we have some seminars, workshops, and one MOOC. And this MOOC is for the all citizens, um, Catalonia and for everybody. This is in Spain, in Spain. Also, in the second level, the, um, the, the medium level, the ICT competence. We have an ICT competence course for the all undergraduates at the university is the, has an equivalent for the intermediate level of the ACTIC. And in this course, we work with a digital project in group, in small groups. And we have um, 4,000 students every year. 
Also, we have some in the first level in digital transformation. We have some postgraduate course, some specific specialization, and also a um, master degree about e-learning for the specific teachers. And in all these program, we work with digital competencies. Finally. I try to answer the question to this webinar where we think in Spain we are in the right direction, but we're moving at very slow pace. If we look at the evolution of the workplace and the technology in relation to have a working in education. I think it's very important thinking about the developing programs about digital skills. I don't know if you are read today, I read a paper about ECDL, the fallacy of the digital native, and they say the native have a very good instrumental competence, but they need more the digital competence to use the digital tools. I try I finish with the reflection because it's always thinking how to um, improve or how to make or design the programs to help citizens, students and professionals to have a very good um, digital competence. Not only instrumental, but more general com digital competence. Thank you very much. Here we have the links if you need some more information. And if I have some questions, I have Thank you very much, Monte. Are there any questions for Monte? Please enter them in the chat box if you have any questions. Um, Monte, other than the difficulties that you're encountering in terms of the, the slow rate of, of uh, adapt, uh, adoption, um, what are other challenges that you've encountered? Well, I think the problem in, in the education is slow because the teachers don't have enough um, enough knowledge about the how to use the digital competence and use the digital competence in the normal teaching. And I think the challenge is to improve the the, the teaching um, training or the all levels, primary school, secondary school, and also at the university. I think here at the open university, the teachers have digital competence because we make all in the digital space. But usually in the face-to-face -face university, the teachers don't have a lot of digital competence. And I think the problem is not also how to use the the, the technology, the problem is how to use the technology to change in the methodology also. Because when you use the new technologies, you can change from okay. technology. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker today is uh, Margarita, and she's going to be, she's from the Lithuanian Distance and E-Learning uh, uh, association, and she's going to be talking to us about innovations and channel challenges in technology enhanced learning um, a Lithuania, uh, from a teacher perspective in, in Lithuania. So, um, Margarita, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everybody from Lithuania, from Vytautas Magnus University. And my presentation will be about the, some cases, about the innovations we introduced to, um, in our university and also more in broader sense in Lithuania. Uh, so uh, I will speak about virtual mobility in higher education. Uh, already previous speakers uh, mentioned it, but um, uh, my Position is through the teacher 
through the challenges teacher face, university teacher face uh, when applying virtual mobility. Also about the um, possibility to introduce open educational resources to curriculum and uh, uh, a little bit about quality assurance. So, <clears throat> um, actually, um, innovations here coming through, here in Lithuania, coming through the cooperation between tertiary education institutions and Lithuania Association of Distance and E-Learning, uh, which is uh, led by Vitotas Magnus University. And uh, we seek uh, to develop synergy among national, regional, European initiatives initiatives and programs. And uh, through the conferences, training, seminars, joint project, research, and uh, <clears throat> quality assurance actions. Uh, so the main is virtual mobility. Uh, actually, when we, uh, Diana spoke about this, Helga um, spoke about virtual mobility, but uh, a lot of questions uh, was uh, um, coming to us when we started to, to think how we are going to uh, introduce and implement virtual mobility for our students and for our teachers. And the questions uh, was uh, uh, how can teachers and institutions prepare for virtual mobility? what are virtual mobility processes, process phases, and what decisions need to be taken to start virtual mobility processes. Not so easy. Not so easy when, when you are in the traditional university and you, when you want that more teachers would, uh, would apply this uh, innovation. How to design a curriculum for virtual mobility is actually different what competences may be improved or developed in virtual mobility activities, how to implement and what learning and teaching methods, and what technological solutions should be used. So uh, innovations uh, came through not only one, but maybe um, several projects but the latest one is uh, uh, when consortium universities developed virtual mobility curriculum for a master degree program in a collaborative way by teachers from consortium universities. The uh, consortium universities is Pavia University, Oviedo University, Spain, Open University, Portugal, um, Loven University and our university. Each partner leads the development of at least two study subjects or two modules of the six ECTS credits. Uh, in total, master um, study program in educational science composed from 10 modules. Yes, but it's uh, actually program interdisciplinary as um, mm, uh, it was used best experience in the field of education, ECT and management. And then program already created is a unique online program or mm, as a whole or split and, and used by modules. modules. It could uh, be implemented later by, uh, by each partner individually or in cooperation with one or two partners. Yes, uh, there is our um, you know, platform with the, um, with the open courses, uh, uh, partly open, you know, they are one of set of the course open and, and um, <clears throat> students could re register for virtual mobility, could apply for the, co uh, for the course in any university uh, participating in the program uh, and uh, they become virtual mobile. 
but actually to create the curriculum for virtual mobility, it was uh, really a challenge for um, um, teachers. Of course, we already did that, but it's a challenge because of many, many issues. First of all, uh, because of um, the study timelines, different study timelines in different countries, also some intercultural issues. Oh, here is uh, in this table um, is uh, just the example of uh, the uh, 10 modules, uh, 10 st st subjects we created and uh, every uh, every university in partnership with another university was responsible for were responsible was responsible for the creation of the module and uh, actually we find here is our curriculum um, modules names of the modules different kinds school leadership uh, education for sustainable development uh, uh, web ethics, uh, management of education innovations, uh, uh, intercultural education and communication. It's, it's already exists, but the challenge is uh, for collaboration of teachers from different institutions. Actually, it's a very different experience in uh, creating uh, online courses. Different quality assurance requirements in every university. Different um, scenarios of contact hours. University applies. Different experience in online learning, not only for teachers, but also for students. You know, some... Um, um, it, it is uh, quite uh, not, uh, not easy to encourage, you know, teachers work collaboratively and uh, try to uh, together to decide um, on uh, group work, on collaboration for the students. Yes, and um, also, you know, understanding of uh, time. Uh, point of view to the, this um, virtual mobility and other challenges. So, but we managed, we already have this and uh, the project uh, and uh, virtual mobility was successful for more than 70 students from this uh, uh, 16 universities. Another innovation is the um, <clears throat> related to open educational resources, what is um, also based on um, some projects, project initi initiative, uh, and it is um, directed to foster open international collaboration of professionals for innovation and also to train the staff of educational institutions to use, reuse and develop of open educational resources and create of innovative curriculum for work-based learning using OER. Uh, this innovation is not, uh, mm, it's not only at universities, also for them, for that schools and centers. Mm. Key innovations in training of teachers and trainers as well as adult educators are open educational resources as the, you know, as the definition, as the um, what it is, an open curriculum development and license. Actually, it uh, uh, takes time to discuss with teachers and to, uh, uh, to make it uh, clear. 
also open collaboration, as well as designing curriculum for diverse target groups, including the mode of work based word based learning, and also validation of open educational resources. Uh, but, um, you know, we have uh, good results uh, for developed for teachers, for university and that teachers. Uh, in the project, Open Prof project, we developed three main, uh, three training materials on OR and sustainability models, what um, covers um, open educational resources, types, characteristics, uh, development processes, guidance for uh, use, reuse, and creation. Uh, second uh, training material, it is ICT tools uh, to develop and adapt OER. And also to license uh, for, for OER use. And the third uh, training material is innovative curriculum designing for work-based learning for C-Web, Web and Adult Education. So, uh, it was uh, created by teachers, 24 open educational resources and 24 uh, was adopted. So, you can see it's uh, um, small pieces of open educational resources, but they are unique as teachers did the, them the, themselves. And also, not only this, but also implemented to, the, to their curriculum. And um, in total, 48 open educational resources um, was created in partnership, and it's in national languages and English languages. And as uh, all uh, resources uh, uh, were integrated to curriculum, so um, six open courses have been created, and those courses are on national languages and also in English language. Uh, actually, it is also a great experience um, for uh, teachers, uh, you know, to start in steps, uh, consequently, um, the courses and open them if, for self-learning or some for registered, uh, registered users, um, for, uh, for adult education, for CVET or some, some for university students. So all all the, them are online. Openprof.com. Uh, so uh, requirements that we think for teachers for cooperation in Openprof, but also in, in uh, more general, is yes to have some digital competence. Yes, maybe not the framework, but, you know, starting openness is important for idea sharing, critics and learning, benevolent attitude towards collaboration and innovations. Um, and uh, uh, challenges that teachers face creating and adapting open educational uh, resources is tools to be used for creation, rules for publishing, requirements for OER editable version, also questions to discuss how much open educational resources should be open, should, should be adapted to, to become a new open education resource, and how open are we? Should we open our, no, mm, our resources for commercial use or not. So many questions have been discussed. 
during the process. And, and finally, going to an end, uh, also we used, uh, we used um, several project, projects for, uh, uh, to support teachers for quality assurance of online learning and uh, integration of ECT in VET and CVET, and also to university um, teaching. And uh, uh, this uh, products that was created allow us to use accreditation of formal and not formal courses by peer review at Lithuanian uh, e-learning and distance association, it's already exist, and also allow us to develop quality assurance procedures at university level for distance learning courses. So, I finished. Thank you for, um, for listening to me. Thank you very much, Margarita. We've got a couple of questions still in the chat area, so I'd like to ask those uh, while we still have, re have everyone here. Uh, the first one is from Johanny, who is asking you, what is your experience in openness uh, among teachers? How many of them are actually sharing and giving away OER resources? I think, I think he's it's probably in regards to Wiley's seven, uh, five, uh, five R's. Uh, and do they feel rewarded in any way when they have uh, shared content? So the, the questions are in the chat box. If, if there's a lot of them there, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, actually, teachers are interested, uh, um, are very interesting, but they are more willing to use open educational resources than yeah. to create and share. <laughs> because it is, it is not, not easy work and, and uh, requires a lot of efforts, not only efforts, but some skills, you know. So it's, uh, mm, we need to encourage and maybe more, something to do more for teachers uh, if we want to, to, that they would share with, with create and share. Open and are there any rewards? You know, but... Uh, you know, a reward comes when you see <laughs> that in your course, when you adapt open educational resource or create, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, students are happy and they like to use this, uh, so it's, it's kind of reward, but, uh, you know, it could be, it could be mm -hmm. another type of reward. You know, some, some collaboration with them uh, with the, uh, on international level and to exchange of good practices, of knowledge, it's also mm -hmm. rewards for, for teachers. Mm -hmm. But of course, for that we need uh, projects, we need programs, and uh, when you are alone, okay. it's, it's quite difficult, if you are alone. But actually, yes, we are working with teachers and, and try and encourage, and, and it, it, is, uh, um, it is the way what is coming. Uh, we also have a question. Yeah, Johanny writes that the happy students is a great reward. Uh, and uh, he was commenting that there, there might, be, might be a good idea to also have some re recognition um, for the faculty. Uh, Helga has a question. Uh, do you also work with university teachers? Yes, surely, surely, yes. We always, uh, when it is possible, it, it's, uh, um, you know, as I uh, uh, represent uh, not only, uh, you know, distance, Lithuania Distance and uh, E-Learning Association, but also university. So, um, here is our um, study innovation centers. We have the course for uh, for uh, um, uh, common creative and open educational licenses, common creative licenses, but but also for open educational resources, just for teachers and uh, okay. and uh, yes, yes, encourages okay. them. Um, Johanny had asked a question um, that. Uh, <clears throat> it was actually to Monse, but maybe you and Monse could also respond to it. Uh, 
The question was, uh, what is your experience in openness among teachers? How many of them are actually, uh, oh, sorry, that's the wrong question. Oh, I got to try to find my way up the chat here. That question you've already answered, Margarita, so I'm just going to skip that. Uh, digital natives, um, I think it's a myth that makes us believe that young people understand and use digital tools so naturally, but it is very much an individual skill. Do you, uh-oh, I've lost the, lost the chat. Do you see any signs of frustrations in youth that can't use technology? Uh, perhaps Monte and Margarita or anyone else uh, on the panel could respond to that question. Okay, Monte. If you want, I can respond. Well, the, the question is the native is an individual competence. I think it's, I think it's, you know, the the problem, I think it's, um, they are very happy using technology, but they don't know how to use the technology for a, application to the collaboration and to the other things. I think this is the big problem. And I think the, the, here at the university we make some research about our students are students to 30, 40, and 50 years old. And we make a research with the Canada University, with the young students, and there are no difference mm -hmm. between instrumental technology. There are differences between the use of the technology, because the young people have more strategy how to use the technology to collaborate, to um, research or have a good research and so on. And the young students have the instrumental um, competency, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to use as well the technology for real work, for communication, for collaboration. Does anyone else on the panel like to respond to that question? If I'm allowed, I can. Okay, Diana. I already raised my hand, but <laughs> I'm blowing up. Okay, so yes, so we've seen quite a lot of frustration. And I'll give you, if I'm allowed, two examples briefly. First is the frustration mainly for in-depth using, which we saw for our students, which are part of the virtual mobility project, the, the top tech, which we are running since 2008. So. 2008 uh, ideas of using, you know, Skype or voice thread to create online presentation completely virtually was quite new for even for for students, you know, so that six, seven years ago we were still using it. But they become more confident as they start using them. So in that use of certain technologies which are new for them, like this year we are using Orasma, which is an augmented reality tool for the students to create really an augmented reality application virtually working completely one year, two students in Romania, two students in America. So we always push the boundaries to them and to be able to learn in depth more about new technology. So that's their basic frustration because once the, some tools or applications of technology become more, how to say, familiar, they mm -hmm. become confident so we are pushing it to expose them to very, very new technology, so we will increase their confidence. That's uh, how we get rid of the frustration which they have at the beginning, because with the popular technology, they know how to do it, but with the rest, it's not. And the other is, two years ago, we had a project, a small project, where we put students with senior, uh, seniors, usually around 55 to 75 years old. Uh, to show them how to use properly common applications and so Facebook, Skype, and even blogs, and how to read online uh, newspapers, and how to aggregate news online, and so on. And the frustration we've seen in the seniors was very different from the frustration in the youngsters. 
the youngsters felt very frustrated that the seniors couldn't really understand some basic concepts, but could really grasp, or grasp sorry, the communication part. So they mm. were much more eager to communicate freely and openly than the youngsters, which was surprising even for me. But uh, they, the youngsters had the frustration that they couldn't explain it easily or friendly or enough for the older generation to understand it, because we put the students to be the trainers of the older generation. Mm. So there are, it, it, you can carry on for ages for the digital natives and digital things like that. Mm. But um, the biggest problem is confidence on using the tool. So if you expose them to the tool and you just explain it to a bit and you encourage them to use it, then there's no difference between age groups or level of education and so on. That's the only thing, is increasing their confidence on using the tool and then they are more comfortable and the frustrations almost disappear. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when it works, like when it doesn't work like today, then it, we are all frustrated. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, Helga, you would like to add? Yes, just a brief comment that it's, uh, I think it's, it's one thing, the, uh, the use of technology, but uh, in our case, um, I think it's more like the question, why do we need to, to use that for, uh, for our sort of formal learning? Because I guess uh, students are very often, they very often use technology for their informal learning uh, situation. But when it gets mm -hmm. to, for example, I primarily work with face-to-face -face students and I work with uh, blended uh, models. And then, of course, the question, or with virtual mobility, that it is, to some extent, um, some form of blending. And then I always, you know, get the question, like, why do we need to have the, you know, have the technology? And what's the, why, why is it meaningful? So I guess um, understanding the, the relevance of using technology with our students, I think it's the second most important thing. I, I guess it's the same thing the same applies to teachers as well when it comes to integrating technology in primary, secondary education. <laughs> Johanny made the comment that maybe we need to read some fairy tales for the digital natives so they can form some common general metaphors that explain technological concepts. And Diana and Margarita unfortunately need to leave. Uh, so we probably should wrap things up. Uh, there was just one last question from Yohani to Monte uh, about moving from consumer to producer. Have you heard about any Spanish initiatives? Um, Monte, did you want to try to answer that question? Yes. Yeah. The question is moving the from the consumer to, to the producer. Consumer to producer. Yes. Yes. For us, it's very important. We participate also in a, in a project about the OER, OER in open educational resource at the analysis how the student can be more um, consumer, uh, more producer than consumer. And also the, the, the problem is the same. How they know how to use the technology to the real application. In our case at the Open University, the students make a digital project that I tell before. And when they make the, uh, the result of the project is a web making collaboration, for a web, for a real situation of the process of the professional um, space. For example, the people who are, who study tourism make a work for to promote something, no? And in this case, they give to a creators, not only a consumers. And for us, this is very important. And also with the when we teach projects at the university, the results of the projects are also the materials or the results for the next students. 
en la idea es de students and the give a, a, a creators and not only a passive lectors of the, the tools and the resource. Okay. Great. Are there any further uh, questions or comments um, about uh, that, that anyone would like to pose to the panel? Okay. Um, oh, wait a minute. Liz is, uh, Liz is typing. I'd like to take this moment to invite you all to the next webinar. Um, which is on using ICT in, in medical environments, and that will be at 3 o'clock. So if you're interested, uh, please be sure to attend. The topic is called From ICT Focus Group Analysis uh, in Home Hospital Education uh, to a Practical Guide, uh, the LEHO Project. So if you're interested in attending that, uh, please do um, take some time and, and go visit that at 3 o'clock today. Uh, the link has been posted here uh, as well. Thank you, Christina. So thank you all for coming today and for your questions and being so involved and participating in uh, European Distance Learning Week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the le next webinar and also next year when we hold European Distance Learning Week again. Thank you. And of course, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.